The Lord be with you. Folks, good morning. We're grateful that you are here with us. Um, we're having some technical difficulties today. We are, I'm told that we are streaming live to Facebook right now, but for some reason YouTube is being a bit high maintenance, so we are not streaming to both platforms. Um, so if you know of somebody who usually joins us on YouTube, you can t call, text them, tell them to hop on over to Facebook. But if not, um, I will upload, uh, as I do every Sunday, I will upload the the recording of this service to YouTube uh, later on this afternoon. So I hope you are well and uh, dry on this wet Sunday as we um, observe the second Sunday in Lent. A few quick announcements uh, and then we will <clears throat> get on our way this day. I'd like to make two book recommendations uh, for you and I'll send out an email with both of these um, later. Um, this is year B in the lectionary, which is the year that as, ter and as far as the gospel readings go, tend to focus on the gospel of Mark. Um, so I wanted to share with you a commentary that, I, that will be, um, that I've already referenced in last week's sermon, this week's sermon, and I will probably reference a lot this year. It's called Binding the Strong Man. Uh, it's a commentary on the book of, on the gospel of Mark that was written um, it was actually published the year I was born, in 1988, by Ched Myers. It is considered by many to be, uh, frankly, the most important um, commentary on the Gospel of Mark um, ever written. Uh, again, it's called Binding the Strong Man, a political reading of Mark's story of Jesus. So if you want to go a little bit deeper this year with me, um, then I do recommend adding this to your, your theological um, bookshelf, Binding the Strong Man. And then secondly, one of, the, one of my uh, spiritual disciplines, I know for some of you all as well during the season of Lent, is just reading books on, on racism and on anti-racism. And I wanted to share with you a book that I just got in the mail this week um, and just started reading a few days ago. It's a new book called The Sum of Us, What Racism Costs Everyone and How We Can Prosper Together um, by Heather McGee. It was just published. Uh, uh, she was interviewed on NPR, which is what brought this to my radar. Uh, but it really is, I'm about a fourth of the way through it. And it goes back over the past um, 40, 50 years and talks about how the racist policies um, in this country um, obviously have negatively affected persons of color, disproportionately affected persons of color, but that um, really, pardon my French, we all get screwed over. Uh, by these policies, regardless of the color of our skin. One of the central themes she uses um, in, in the book so far is called Draining the Pool, about how uh, after the civil rights, the initial civil rights movement in the 1960s, um, many uh, places throughout the South, many um, cities, rather than uh, integrate the public swimming pools, just drained all of them rather than integrate them, which cut off that important public service to people regarding of the color of their skin and kind of uses that as a metaphor uh, and extends it to, uh, to health care, to voting rights and other things and, and, and poverty in this country. Um, so I highly recommend that to you all. Again, it's called The Sum of Us, What Racism Costs Everyone and How We Can Prosper Together. Another Lenten discipline um, uh, that we invite you to join us is our prayer wall, which is outside of the sanctuary that Mark and Beth Alexander were so kind enough to put together. Uh, it is uh, a, some fencing material that has the design of an ampersand in it to represent our Lenten theme again and again. And you can come at night or day 24-7 um, throughout the season of Lent and come up uh, and get a little strip of recycled um, trash can liner, write a prayer or just a name of someone that you're thinking of or anything, and then weave it into the ampersand. Um, so we invite you to join us uh, with today's weather. Might not be the best afternoon, but as soon as it clears up, we invite you to do that. Finally, I wanted to give an update on Janet Kuntz. I spoke, I, I visited with Janet uh, last week at St. Joe's. Uh, and I spoke again with Charlie Kuntz this morning, um, and Janet is in good spirits. She's still at the hospital, um, still having some high blood pressure. They think it might have something to do with her kidneys. Uh, and she's meeting with a kidney specialist today, uh, so not much of an update other than that, but uh, continue to pray uh, for both uh, Janet and 
and Charlie uh, and all the uh, health care workers that are uh, looking after her right now. So friends, let's breathe together, and then uh, Isaac will lead us in our prayer of the day. Lydia will lead us in our prelude, and then Isaac's going to lead us in a little bit of a different kinesthetic call to worship for us today. Friends, let's breathe in God's mercies. And breathe out God's mercies to others. Let's breathe in God's mercies. And breathe out God's mercies to others. And finally, let us breathe in God's mercies. And breathe out God's mercies to others. Siblings in Christ, let us worship God. God, your son Jesus Christ bore the cross for our salvation and was raised from the dead for the redemption of the world. Give us the courage to take up our cross and follow him that through his grace we may accept the cost of faithful discipleship and receive the joy of everlasting life with Christ, who lives with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please rise in body or in spirit as you are able and we stay or we stay seated. <laughs> and join us for a call to worship. Today in worship, we will be reminded that again and again, we are called to listen. 
This is the part of our invitation as a people of faith, not only to speak, pray, and sing, but to listen. And I will be the first to say, listening is hard. From our toddler years on up, we struggle to listen, particularly when we don't know what we're listening for or we don't agree with what we're hearing. So for just a moment, as we gather ourselves for worship, I want to invite you to join me in a kinesthetic call to worship by embodying our prayer as I prompt you. Let us listen. Let us pray. Family of faith, I invite you to close your eyes. Rest your feet on the floor beneath you. Release any tension you are holding in your jaw, your neck, your shoulders, your hands, your legs, your feet. Take a deep breath in and slowly let it out. The Hebrew word for breath, ruach, is the same word for spirit. So as you breathe, imagine that it is God who is filling up your lungs with energy and love. Trust that God is as close as your very breath. Now, I invite you to still your mind. Imagine your mind as a river. Thoughts will drift into view. They always do. However, instead of holding on to those thoughts, allow yourself to let them float by and listen. Listen deep. Listen far. Listen wide. Listen. The sound of your breath is the sound of the divine. This is a holy space. Let us worship God. Our first hymn this morning is hymn number 410. God is calling through the whisper. Often, the first step to change is listening. We have to listen to those we've hurt. 
We have to listen to creation as she cries. We have to listen to the voice of the oppressed if we ever hope to make things right. So today, as we begin our prayer of confession, we will start with a moment of silence, a moment to listen. And then we will pray together, trusting that God is always listening to us and that God's ears listen with love. So let us confess. Listening, God, take what is closed in us and open it. Take what is distracted in us and settle it. Take what is hurting in us and hold it. Take any and all parts of us that create distance from you. For we are like Peter, O oh God. We argue what we don't know. We fear what we cannot see. And we almost always speak sooner than we listen. So open us, settle us, hold us, and forgive us. We long to hear you more clearly. We long to know you more fully. With hope, we pray, and with gratitude, we confess. Amen. Siblings in Christ, hear the waters of God's mercies. We confess with gratitude because we know that God already has heard and forgiven us. No matter what we have done or left undone, we are held in God's hand. So rest in this good news. God invites us in. God meets us where we are. God hears our prayers. And God forgives us. Thanks be to God for a love like that. God, we cannot hear the trees growing, seeds pushing up through the dirt into the sun. And we cannot hear a single drop of rain missing one in the many. We cannot hear the weight of people's grief, a burden that so often is silent. And we cannot hear when hearts are changed. But you can. You hear it all. So once again, we come to you with bowed heads and hopeful hearts, asking that you would lend us your ears. Help us to hear as you hear, so that we can live as you lived. We are listening. Amen. Our first scripture reading comes from the book of Psalms, chapter 22, verses 23 through 31. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. Stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he did not despise or abhor the affliction of the afflicted. He did not hide his face from me, but heard when I cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will pay before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before him. 
For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. To him indeed shall all who sleep in the earth bow down. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, and I shall live for him. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord and proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying that he has done it. Holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks be to God. Thank you, choir, and thanks be to God. So friends, a quick word before I read the second reading. In, in both last week's sermon and in this week's sermon and in future sermons to come, uh, I will be using the term empire. And I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page about what that, what that means. Um, when you think about the word empire, you're probably having a lot of negative connotations, and for good reason. You might be thinking of Star Wars. Uh, empire is not good uh, in Star Wars. Um, in the context of scripture, we, you, you might be thinking about the Roman Empire, which is always shown as a vehicle of, of oppression um, to, uh, in the Gospels and in the, uh, in, in the the wider context of what we call the New Testament. Um, but we can also use the contemporary theologians and preachers, we use that term empire uh, in a contemporary way. And I want to make sure that we're very clear about what I mean when I say empire in terms of the context of, of where we are right now. Empire does not necessarily equate the government. So when I'm saying empire, I'm not, to say that I'm talking about the government as a whole is an overly simplistic view of that. Empire also is not a euphemism. 
in any way of conservatism or Republican. Uh, empire is a nonpartisan term that is meant to speak of any, uh, any system, any legislation, any ideology that buys into a zero-sum game. That is to say that in order for me to win, someone else has to lose, right? The idea that in order for folks to be up here, they must do so on the backs of those that are down here. That is the idea of empire. And empire can manifest itself, it manifests itself in many different ways, certainly not least among them being uh, the racism that this country um, has, has, has uh, been founded on over the past several centuries. So I just want to notice that when we use that term of empire, it can mean a bunch of, of different things, but primarily um, it is the idea that in order for some folks to win, other people have to lose. Um, and that, uh, that is what Jesus Christ came to challenge and to stand against. And Mark's gospel in particular uses that as its foundation. So I just wanted to kind of explain that term a little bit more before we go uh, any deeper. Uh, today's passage comes to us from Mark's, uh, Mark's Gospel, chapter 8, verses um, 31 uh, through 38. And uh, I also want to read today's passage from the Common English Bible. Uh, this is a great translation of the Bible that came out uh, it was about 10 years ago. Uh, and I frequently will read it alongside the NRSV and, and encourage you to do so as well. So let us listen again for what uh, God is saying to God's church. Jesus and his disciples went into the villages near Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do, you, uh, who do people say that I am? They told him, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others one of the prophets. He asked them, well, what about you? Who do you say that I am? Peter answered, you are the Christ. Jesus ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then Jesus began to teach his disciples saying, the human one must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and the legal experts, and be killed. And then, after three days, rise from the dead. He said this plainly. But Peter took hold of Jesus and, scolding him, began to correct him. Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, then sternly corrected Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are not thinking God's thoughts, but human thoughts. After calling the crowd together with his disciples, Jesus said to them, all who want to come after me must say no to themselves. Take up their cross and follow me. All who want to save their lives will lose them. But all who lose their lives because of me and because of the good news will save them. Why would people gain the whole world but lose their lives? What will people give in exchange for their lives? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this unfaithful and sinful generation, the human one, will be ashamed of that person when he comes in the Father's glory with the holy angels. Holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks be to God. Friends, let us pray. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So I invite you right now to think of a time that you learned a hard truth, that you heard something that was hard to hear, a hard truth. 
Think of a moment when you were told something by someone you either love or trust that forced you to deconstruct your previous way of thinking and to reorient it in a different direction. Maybe it was your spouse or a dear friend. Maybe it was a pastor or a coworker. Maybe even a child. Or perhaps nothing more or less than the very words of Jesus Christ. It was this latter category that drew Peter to rebuke in today's passage from Mark's Gospel. Chronologically speaking, we're doing things a little bit out of order because sometimes that's just the nature of the Revised Common Lectionary. Today's passage takes place immediately before the story of the Transfiguration, which we observed a few weeks ago on the Sunday before Ash Wednesday. This passage is the conclusion of the first half of Mark's Gospel, where Jesus pivots from his Galilean ministry to the inevitable, the inevitable violence that awaits him in Jerusalem. So Jesus asks his disciples who they think he is, and as is usually the case, bless his heart, Peter is the first to answer. You are the Christ, he says, or Messiah, depending on which version of the Bible you have in front of you. Christ literally means anointed one, and is nothing more than the Greek version of the Hebrew word Messiah. It was an overtly political term. In the Hebrew scriptures, what we call the Old Testament, the Messiah is one who will destroy world powers in an act of judgment, will deliver Israel from her enemies and restore the nation of Israel. So Peter, for the briefest moments, believes that he has answered the question correctly. But then Jesus goes on to redefine, reorient, Peter's concept of his Messiah-ness. Jesus gives the first of three portents about what is going to happen to him when they reach Jerusalem. Again, Jesus says the following, the human one must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the legal experts, and be killed, and then after three days rise from the dead. So a few things to unpack here about what Jesus is saying in response to Peter's answer. First of all, Jesus replaces Peter's name for him. Remember, Peter called him Christ or, or Messiah. Jesus replaces that term with another one, the human one, or as it might be translated in other versions of the Bible, the, the son of man. The human one is also a phrase that had overtly political tones. It's actually a reference to the book of Daniel in the Old Testament, whose the, the purpose of the book of Daniel was to establish God's sovereignty over oppressive political regimes. And secondly, Jesus is rejecting Peter's notion that what is in store for them as his disciples is honor, privilege, affluence, and political power. Here, Peter is promoting a version of the prosperity gospel nearly 2,000 years before Joel Olstein ever entered the scene. Ched Myers, in his seminal book that I mentioned earlier, Binding the Strong Man, says the following. He says that according to the understanding of Peter, Messiah necessarily means royal triumph and the restoration of Israel's collective honor. But against this, Jesus argues that the human one necessarily means suffering. In other words, Peter's fantasies of power must be censured by clear-eyed realism. But Peter doesn't like the fact that Jesus is reigning on his parade. Peter attempts to silence Jesus, tries to make him stop this nonsense, but Jesus won't be seduced into taking the easy way out. Jesus didn't spend all that time in the wilderness being tempted by Satan just to turn around and forget those lessons that he learned there. Instead, Jesus rebukes Peter and tells him to stop tempting him to turn the other way. And in his rebuke, Jesus tells Peter, and everybody gathered by him and us today, 
that we have to say no to ourselves, take up our cross, and follow him. So this much is clear. In the time of Jesus and his disciples, the cross meant one thing and one thing only. A lengthy, agonizing, and humiliating public execution. Crucifixion was the form of capital punishment that the Roman Empire reserved for political dissidents, particularly those of a lower class. You see, if you were wealthy and affluent and you were sentenced to death, you were afforded a, an execution that was quick and painless, probably beheading. But if you were a marginal uh, member, a marginal citizen of the Roman Empire, then you were given no such luxury. Instead, what it waited for you was to be tortured and then forced literally to carry your cross or to pick up your cross to the place of execution and then be tied and or nailed to your cross, naked and bloodied, and exposed to the elements for multiple days until death mercifully takes you. Now, I know that's a really graphic depiction, but there's really no way to sugarcoat it. Jesus telling his disciples and us that we are supposed to take up our cross, it, it strikes fear in their hearts and frankly in mine as well. As Chad Myers puts it, the turn of phrase, to pick up your cross, could have no other meaning except as an invitation to share the consequences facing those who dared challenge the ultimate power of empire. So in light of this reading of today's text, Jesus' message seems stark. He's leveling with his disciples and telling them that there's real political consequences to the good news, to this euangelion that we were introduced last week. Jesus is telling his disciples, and Mark is telling the readers of his gospel that the consequences of promoting this good news can and will lead to capital punishment on the grounds of insurgency. So I'll admit this is some pretty heavy stuff, not the most uplifting sermon I've probably ever preached from this pulpit, uh, but it is the journey of Lent, and we have to listen to some hard truths. It, this passage reminds us of the inherently subversive nature of the gospel. The euangelion, the good news, is a call to action. It's a call to resist any power or person any institution or ideology that profits at the expense of those who are poor, marginalized, disabled, oppressed, or discriminated against. Today's passage from Mark's Gospel reminds us that any version of Christianity that exists in and of itself in the pursuit of affluence, power, prestige, or comfort is, well, just not the Gospel of Jesus Christ. So what does that mean for us? As far as I know, there is no one among us who is worried about being put to death by the state for being Christian. Not, not in this country, at least. And yet, this passage reminds us that sometimes we need to listen to hard truths about the, con the consequences of being public practitioners of the gospel. You know, just before... You all called, uh, I, just, just before I was called to be your pastor, Beaumont Presbyterian Church, after much thoughtful, prayerful, and biblically-based discernment, decided to widen its welcome to fully affirm our LGBT plus siblings. You all decided that never more would we, for example, deny a same-sex couple the same hospitality that we would to one of our heterosexual members. And some members of this congregation found that expression of the good news to be offensive, and they left. And it hurt. It's always painful to see fellow members of our faith family depart over disagreements like that. But I am proud of this congregation for taking that stand. I'm proud because y'all knew that y'all would lose members, and you did it anyway. Y'all did it, I think, because you understood that what is always more important than the size or affluence or influence of a congregation is its fidelity to Jesus Christ.
the human one who calls us to radical hospitality and welcome. All who want to save their lives will lose them, the human one said in today's passage. But all who lose their lives because of me and because of the good news will save them. Again and again, God meets us in these stories of scriptures and invites us to listen to some hard truths about the gospel, this good news, this euangelion. God reminds us that the gospel calls us not to do something because it is the easy or popular or safe thing to do, but that the gospel calls us to do something because it's the right thing to do. That's what it means for us to take up our cross. It means to say proudly and publicly that we are not going to participate in empire, but we will only participate in the kingdom of God. We do not take our orders from Caesar, who, by the way, was called the divine one, but we take our orders from Jesus Christ, who Mark calls the human one. And to make these claims and to live our lives accordingly means listening to some hard truths, uh, hard truths, some hard truths about what Jesus expects of you and of me, some hard truths about how the church has not always lived up to the righteousness to which Jesus calls us, some hard truths about how the church has been complicit in upholding systems of racism and patriarchy. Some hard truths about how the church has sometimes sacrificed its commitment to the gospel in the interest of more money, more members, more affluence in the community. Or perhaps simply the hard truth that Jesus Christ was not born into this world to make those of us who are middle class, heterosexual, and white comfortable. But the good news is this, my friends. If we lose that life, we'll find another. And that version of our Christian life might just be the one that leads us to be a more just, righteous, and welcoming community for those on the margins. Sometimes, if we put away our human thoughts and focus on God's thoughts, we might just lose a life that was never life as God intended it. If we focus on God's thoughts and join Christ in subverting the powers of empire in its many forms, we might just find that the life we were living was not life-giving for the most vulnerable around us. And we have to ask ourselves if that's a life that we really want, if we are to be faithful followers of the human one. Now, I realize that these are some really deep questions that cannot be fully fleshed out uh, in one sermon. And, and, and there's a lot of complex answers and consequences and implications to them. But such is the work of Lent. And I hope you'll join me in listening to the Gospels uh, and continue to listen to the Gospel and to be open to the uncomfortable and yet liberating truths that might find us there. Friends, in the name of God, the Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer, May all of us, God's beloved children, say, Amen. As we continue to listen to the gospel and find ways that it compels us to, uh, to be faithful to it, a very appropriate hymn for us to sing, of course, would be 450, Be Thou My Vision.
Friends, you may be seated. So friends, before I forget, I uh, am reminded um, that this is the month of which it has now been a year since Lydia has been our organist. Um, and just wanted to say, um, Lydia, how grateful we are to have you, and we, we hope that we will have many, many years together. Um, Lydia was our organist for uh, only a few weeks. It, uh, before COVID-19 hit. So unfortunately, many of y'all have not had, you know, a whole lot of chance to know her. But for those of us that have been here on Sundays, um, we really enjoy working with you, Lydia, and we appreciate you being with us. Friends, please join me in, uh, this is a responsive affirmation of faith that you'll find printed in your bulletin. We believe. Sometimes our belief is confident like a child on a dance floor, unashamed and wildly genuine, we believe. Sometimes our belief is distant, flickering and calling out to us like a lighthouse on the sea, we believe. Sometimes our belief shows up as passion, guiding the way we vote, shop, give, live, trust, and hope, we believe. Sometimes our belief is like a shadow, faith stitched to our heels, unmovable, unlosable, a gift for winding journeys, we believe. Sometimes our belief exists like growing pains. We step forward, we fall back, but again and again, Jesus invites us to listen, to grow, to take another step. So again and again, we speak these truths out loud. We believe, we believe. Again and again, we believe. Thanks be to God. Amen. Friends, we'll now go to God in prayer. Uh, we will have a responsive prayers of the people this day. So when I pray, Holy God, I invite you to respond simply by saying, hear our prayer. So friends, trusting in God's promises, let us pray for the world and for our needs, saying, Holy God, hear our prayer. God, you blessed Abraham and Sarah and promised to make them ancestors of many na nations. In Jesus Christ, you have opened your covenant to everyone who lives by faith in you. For all the descendants of Abraham and Sarah, both Jews and Christians, that they may trust in your promise, dwell together in peace, and be a sign of your abiding love. Holy God, hear our prayer. God, Jesus, your child, the human one, called disciples to follow his way of sacrificial love. So for all pastors and teachers and of, and elders and leaders, that they may lead the church by humble example, take up their cross in faithful service, and live for the sake of the gospel, we pray. Holy God, hear our prayer. God, your reign encompasses all the earth, though many do not remember your gracious sovereignty. So we pray for peace among the nations and for integrity within governments, that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Holy God, hear our prayer. God, you hear the cry of the poor, and you satisfy the hungry with good things. For the poor and the oppressed, that they may find deliverance. And for all who voluntarily take up the cross of self-denial to serve the poor and alleviate human misery we pray. Holy God, hear our prayer. God, you know the needs of the afflicted, and you hear their cries. For those who suffer illness of body or mind, that they may find relief from suffering and be restored to wholeness, we pray. Holy God, hear our prayer. Gracious God, we pray for the members of this congregation. We pray especially this day for Janet.
Kuntz that they may find the reason for her high blood pressure and get her home to Charlie as soon as possible. So for Janet Kuntz, we pray. We also pray for our wider community and for all those who are working so hard to get as many people as possible vaccinated. vaccinated. We pray with tremendous gratitude for the doctors, the nurses, the healthcare workers, and the volunteers around our Commonwealth who are working tirelessly to help protect us and get us out of this pandemic. So for those folks, we pray this day. And we also pray with tremendous sadness the, for the more than half a million souls that have been lost in this country to COVID-19. We pray for them. We pray for their redemption. We pray for their families who mourn their loss. So for all of those who have lost a friend or a family member to COVID-19, we pray for healing and for peace. Holy God, hear our prayer. Grant these prayers, holy God, by your grace. Stir up in us the will to seek out your kingdom with the dedication of our lives and ministry to the world for the sake of the gospel of the human one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, with grateful hearts, let us give of our tithes and our offerings.
Almighty God, we thank you for the covenant you established with Abraham and Sarah, which you have opened to us through Jesus Christ, the human one. Accept these offerings with the dedication of our lives, that we may be for the world a sign of your abiding love and a testament to your enduring promise. In Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, all glory are yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. So friends, this uh, next hymn that we're singing is, uh, is not in the hymnal, uh, but is a relatively new hymn written by Carolyn Winfrey Gillette that was written in response to many of the, the Black Lives Matter protests that, uh, that happened last year. And then it was very fitting with our uh, theme this day of again and again, um, we are invited to listen. So let us now sing, There Is a Time for Silence. Thank you.
Friends, we're so grateful that you could join us this day, and we hope you will join us next week as we continue our Lenten journey. So friends, now receive the charge and benediction. As you leave this space, may your mouth speak of God's goodness. May your arms hold those in need. May your feet walk toward justice. May your heart trust its worth. May your soul dance in God's grace. And may, be, and may this be your rhythm again and again and again until God's promised day. So in the name of the lover, the beloved, and love itself, go with courage, go with heart, and go in peace. Amen. <laughs>